Hello and welcome to the session. In today's session, we will be discussing about block 3 of uh, MCS 12, which is about the central processing unit. Now, you may be wondering that we, uh, we have already done, the slides are not moving, please check. Uh, we have already done a session on, uh, so this basically covers MCS block 12, that is what I have been saying, that is the reference material. Okay, and uh, what we will be doing uh, uh, in this, why, why we are uh, taking up block 3 after block 4? Technically, block 3 is about the central processing unit. And central processing unit is responsible for execution of instructions primarily. And those instructions are machine instructions, right? So when we learned about the assembly language programming and the microprocessor, what we technically discussed was one of the implementation or one of the examples of uh, a machine which happens to be 8086 microprocessor and the assembly instructions technically are equivalent to machine instructions only. So that gave us an idea of how machine instructions for a machine uh, uh, for 8086 look like. Therefore, now you will be finding that uh, whatever we will be covering in this block will be somewhat easier for you to understand. Okay, number two what I, I must uh, emphasize for you is that you must see all the videos we have done so far. Right? They, they, are, they were actually recorded as live videos, but technically they are just the broadcast videos. And what you can do at your end, you can stop in between, like you can stop this particular video in between, look into your block, look into the slides and go on, I mean go on learning, solving problems and if you are stuck at any point of time, please do not hesitate to ask questions. It's very, very important that you ask questions and we, you already know where exactly you can ask questions, right? So let us begin uh, what, what we have to do today, right? So today's presentation will be focusing on the instruction set of a computer. So we'll be talking about instruction set in general and one instruction set we have already discussed about is 8086. But uh, that and this will try to complete your information about the instruction sets. Then we will be talking about micro operations. Now what happens, you have a given instruction set, okay? Now if, if, we, if we extrapolate it, uh, you have C program, right? And C program is a higher level language program. So any instruction of C, first if it is to be executed, converted into machine level inst instruction, which machine level instructions are somewhat equivalent to assembly level instructions. So technically speaking, your C program will be converted to equivalent machine or assembly equivalent program. Uh, just uh, remove, I mean, just leave aside the assembler directives and so on and so forth. But technically one, one assembly instruction is equal to one machine instruction, right? So keeping that particular constraint uh, con condition into uh, mind, what we are trying to say, so these instructions then a bigger program to smaller instructions of machine level. However, to execute this machine instruction, you once again require even smaller level of instruction or steps, okay? So this is what we would like to discuss today in the form of, these are called micro operations. And micro operations are very close to computer organization of that particular machine, okay? So basically organization comes into that existence at that point of time. So somewhere very close to the hardware. And we would like to discuss some of the circuit, very close uh, circuit related to that kind of a situation. And finally, we will talk about ALU organization, like how ALU will be executing uh, those instructions. What, what I would like to emphasize over here is that ALU execute instructions step in a step by step manner. And those steps are to be followed in a very, very sequential manner, just like your uh, C program when you write. Right? It's followed in a very sequential manner. From first instruction, we move to the second one, unless explicitly you have given a looping instruction. So similarly, in machine level also, we, we follow that kind of a sequence. Uh, ALU follow a typical sequence of instruction. And if there is a change in the sequence, that also is, uh, is to be told. So that is where the control unit of a, a machine comes in. 
All right. So this is how the whole organization of this particular block three is. Okay. So it covers, it starts from like what is an instruction set, moves on to the micro operations, uh, micro operation then to ALU, ALU to control, uh, control unit operations. And then finally we have discussed about a, a reduced instruction set architecture in this particular uh, uh, block, which we may not be discussing in this particular session. <coughs> Okay, moving on to the instruction set. So what do we mean by an instruction set? Technically speaking, simply a set of all the instructions which processor can execute, right? So every processor is supposed to execute a specific set of instructions. And if you remember your 8086 microprocessor, several of those instructions we have discussed, we'll, I'll give you some example once again here of those instructions, okay? But there are a number of instructions which are to be executed by the processor, okay? But what is an instruction, like what, what are the basic components of an instruction is? Well, instruction consists of three basic things. The first one is operation code, right? The second one is addressing modes and the third one is operands. Now operation code basically tells the CPU, in fact, it will be telling the A control unit as well as ALU, what operation is to be performed. For example, addition is to be performed or subtraction is to be performed or multiplication is to be performed or XOR is to be performed, what, what operation is to be performed. So there is a typical operation code. And remember, these operation, when we use assembly, they are mnemonics like add, XOR, etc. But Technically, a machine instruction will always be in bits and bytes. So how the computer will recognize this is an instruction? By the context. When control unit is executing that particular instruction, right, it knows which, which one is instruction and which one is data. So it is the con context of execution of instruction where control unit controls the whole operation very, very well in the central processing unit. So operation code is also binary, right? Just like your ASCII is also binary, right? Okay, then addressing modes. Now we discussed 8086 addressing modes, if you remember. Addressing modes basically tell us that how and where operand can be found. So how an operand can be found is addressing mode and operands, where exactly are the operand, the address of the operand is where it is going to be found how and where, okay? So this is how, so basically an instruction will consist of what operation to be performed and what data on which that particular operation is to be performed. And remember one thing, all the things will be, like instructions will be stored in the, it's a von Neumann machine architecture in general, right? Although even if, uh, uh, so even you use uh, the, uh, that virtual machine, even then, the instruction has to be in the uh, in the main memory before it executes, right? So keeping all those things in mind, what we really know that uh, instruction is one of the simplest of the things, operation code, operate, uh, addressing mode, operands, they will be stored in the memory for Neumann architecture and even the operands are going to be stored into the memory or, or registers, right? Registers are another because registers are the temporary locations within the CPU where which basically help process the information or data in a particular sense, even interpretation of instruction, so many tasks they do, all right. Now, a very important uh, statement which has been made in this particular slide is the number of operands in an instruction. You know, the importance of number of operands in an instruction is very, very high. Why? Because the program size is very much dependent on the number of operands within an instruction. I have shown you an example. Suppose I want uh, I'm using an instruction set which allows me to use three memory operand like the first instruction shown over here. So what I can do in this particular case, what I'm saying, my instruction is add z x comma y, where z is a memory location, x is a memory location, y is a memory location. And you know, the larger is my memory, larger is the number of or bits required to of the address, right? So address of Z will be large, X will be large, and Y will be large. So overall, this instruction is going to be very, very large, but only one instruction is serving the purpose where Z is 
I mean, we are adding x plus y and putting the result into z. So only one instruction is required. This is the condition for a machine which has, which allows us to have three such operands in a, uh, in a particular instruction. However, when we remember a 0 a 6 it allowed only two and uh, I mean even two and one of the operand had to be memory operand, right? So that can be somewhat uh, can be equated to this, these three instructions. So considering a machine where all the operations are performed in the accumulator. So we are, that's why we are naming it AX. So all the operations are performed in accumulator machines. Then how this particular machine, the program will be written, same program, Z gets X plus Y, right? How we are going to perform the program is to be written like this now, load x, right? So x will be loaded to accumulator, then add y into the, uh, into the accumulator, right? So x was already into the accumulator, now y has been added to it, okay? So we get x plus y in the accumulator register as a result of this and then store z. So basically the third operation uh, is going to take ax that is the sum of x plus y to z. So you can see if the number of operands which are allowed in a particular instruction and their type, right, if they are not uh, or not all are memory operands which are allowed, I require three instructions, three machine instructions wherever, uh, where in, in, in this particular machine I only require one machine instruction. So this is the essence, like many machines will have different instruction sets. 8086 has a typical instruction set, but that instruction set is only belonging to x86 family, right? And, and the newer, newer uh, processors have entirely different sets of instruction these days. Uh, just for backward compatibility, they still kept, uh, have kept the 8086 uh, instruction set available in, within those instruction, but they have newer instruction sets available, risk oriented instruction set available, where the number of operands may be less, right? But uh, they, they are doing specific tasks uh, in a particular sense. Anyhow, our concern is that different machines, different kinds of instruction sets. The size of the program does depend on the number of operands which are there within a instruction. So this is what is the explanation of this particular part. Now what are the issues related to instruction sets? The very first issue is instruction formats and instruction lengths. So what happens uh, when, when we are dealing with the different microprocessors, the instruction lengths can be different, okay? In fact, uh, when I was talking about 8086, I made a specific statement that an instruction of 8086 can vary from 8, I mean 8 uh, bits, that is 1 byte to 6 bytes. So there may be different kinds of uh, operand code, the, even the length of operation code are sometimes different in those machines, right? So uh, those machines will have different kinds of operation code, different number of op uh, operands, okay? And different uh, addressing modes making the instruction length very, very different, right? So those basically come under instruction formats. So there can be multiple instruction format where the where you will have suppose you have two uh, one uh, memory and one uh, processor operand. Okay, so that can be one typical kind of instruction format. Uh, there can be a second instruction format where only one operand is specified. So that is a different instruction format. So there can be different instruction format and which will be of different instruction length. Well, remember one particular thing: length of instruction is in bits and bits are at a premium in any processor, right? So instruction length designer have to ensure that all the operand, operations which are important for a machine are part of machine instruction set. Otherwise, uh, machine will require longer time to execute a program, okay? Uh, this I'll concept I'll explain a little bit later also. Now, how many number of operands? Okay, this I have already taken. There can be number of operands, one, two, three, and they determine the size of the program. So we need to determine. If I have three operands, as I showed uh, in the last example, what is the problem with that? The problem with that kind of a situation is uh, you will, your instruction length is going to be very, very long. 
and you don't want to compromise on instruction length. Suppose I'm, a simple instruction can be clear, clear, right? So clear the clear a register. Now that instruction doesn't require much of a space, right? It has to be very, very long. So there has to be a compromise, right? There has to be a compromise when we are designing the instruction set. Then the third thing is different data types supported by machine. That is numbers, character sets, and logical bits. So data types in a machine can be numbers. And in numbers, we have choice. We can represent fixed point numbers. The 8086 have only fixed point numbers. All right. So if I want to perform floating point addition, I required a coprocessor in that particular machine. All right. A coprocessor was uh, designed for the purpose of floating point addition so that any instruction which required floating point addition was passed on to the coprocessor if it exists. Otherwise, there will be a big, big sequence of instruction which are to be executed like Mentisa need to be checked for, uh, sorry, exponent need to be checked, then the denormalization is to be performed, then the addition or subtraction is to be performed, then normalization once again is to be performed. So there is a sequence which are to be performed. Had, it, had this been implemented with the help of hardware in the coprocessor, then the overall in execution of instruction become faster. So if an instruction can be implemented by the hardware, it is always faster. If it is to be simulated with the help of other instructions of the machine, obviously it is going to be slower. So that is how the instruction set designer have to debate whether I would like to include floating point instruction within the processor or not, right? How many, uh, uh, but this, uh, the more instruction you include, the, the, the bigger is your instruction set, the bigger is your instruction set, the, the control unit for that particular unit is going to be, or control unit and the arithmetic uh, logic unit or all those operations are going to be more and more complex. So all these uh, trade-offs are done by instruction set designers, so we rely on them. They are very competent people and let's uh, believe that they are doing the, their job properly. All right. Then different types are supported, right? So different types of data I already said. Okay, character set we have already studied the very first type of character set, ASCII or uh, Unicode, uh, uh, UTF-8 or UTF-16, right? So what, what kind of character set this particular machine is utilizing? In numbers, we also have BCD, which we discussed last time, binary coded decimals, whether addition is to be performed using BCD or not, 8086, allows us to perform BCD based additions, right? So this is how the numbers comes into play. And then logical, logical is zeros and ones only. So the operand, operations related to logical bits. Now different types of instruction, most of these instructions you will find, these are from 8086 only, right? So they can be data transfer instructions, which simply moves data among various registers or memory locations, right? Push pop from the stack, uh, translation is a different kind of instruction which translate the data into uh, from a given set to another. Then exchange, basically exchanging two, uh, two uh, pieces of, uh, I mean, two, two values stored in two different locations and only one of them can be memory like that. Okay, so data transfer instructions are there. Then the data processing where arithmetic instructions, we you know, add, ADC, increment, multiplication, ASCII adjust after addition. So lots of, lots of instructions, you know, which these, all these instructions are coming from 8086. But there can be many more such instructions. I mean, there is no limit on, on the type of instructions which an instruction designer has to do, all right? Then comes the DAA and uh, basically, uh, this, oh sorry, DAA is after AAA. So there is a slight, uh, a logical list, basically not, and, or, ZOR, shift left, shift right, test. Shift left, shift right are very, very important, so we'll discuss about them. Test, we had explained in the 8086, so you will know about it. Program control is very important, okay? So I'll be discussing about call and return a little bit later. Jump, we have already seen. Loop, we have already seen in our sessions on assembly language programming. And then there can be uh, miscellaneous instructions like 8086 as the uh, uh, string related instructions and processing control related instructions, which basically are utilized for special purpose. So in general, a processor will have all 
I mean not all but many of these instructions as per the suitability of the design of that particular processor right and the decision is taken by the instruction designers. Now as I was talking about shift instruction. Now shift instruction is very important. There are, there are three kinds of shift instruction. First is called logical shift, second is called arithmetic shift and the third is called rotate, rotation uh, with shift. So it is not shift, it is rotation based shift alright. So if I say shift right alright. So you can see how the things are moving. So logical shift right, all these three types of instruction that is logical, arithmetic and rotation, they differ only how this bit is going to enter here. If it is a logical shift right, okay, this bit will be moved here, this like that, these movements of bit will be there and this bit will be going out, alright, this just going out and going nowhere and zero will be entering over here this is a logical shift all right so this is the shift right and in shift left zero will be entering over here and everything else will be moving all right this bit will be moving out bit by bit moment over there so this is a simple shift instruction and if you remember we did uh, uh, shift by 4 so 1 2 3 4 four times this particular shift operation like this will be performed all right now when we talk about arithmetic shift in arithmetic shift sign is to be this is actually representing the sign then right so this is maintained so whatever is the sign it is going to be maintained as it is zero will be added here but the sign will be maintained as it is so basically you are not moving sign bit you are just moving the bits otherwise okay so you are just preserving the sign bit when it is shift left, uh, when rotation, that means when this bit is falling off, so it will go back to the highest. So zero will not be entering here. This bit will be going back to this particular location. So this is a rotation, all right? And we actually perform the rotation, all right? So zero will not be entering here, but this particular bit will be coming back and staying over there. So this is the way shift operation works. And shift operation is very simple to implement with the help of shift registers which you have studied in the block 1, right? There are uh, left shift and right shift registers which allow shifting of content. Now this is a very important instruction for us, subroutine call. And this is a very typical example of subroutine call and how it is working. Okay, so what we have, this is our main program, okay? So there are uh, a, a subroutine called named X, all right, and subroutine is at location 200, 201, 202, right. So this is basically performing some operations and thereafter subroutine at some point of time has to return to the main program, all right. So how exactly this sequence goes on, okay. So whenever there is a subroutine call, so this is the flow of control. So program starts executing it went on to 100 then 101 as soon as the 101 instruction is executed which is a call so what exactly is going to happen all the parameters right you you actually pass parameter and uh, you can study this particular concept in uh, unit 4 of uh, assembly language programming also block 4 where the parameters will be passed we have not shown the parameter passing in this particular case we are just showing the subroutine call and subroutine return how exactly it is going to take place but technically there will be a call to a subroutine and there will be parameter which will be passed on to the stack okay that example you can refer to block 4 uh, uh, block 4 unit 4 right okay so it will happen the parameters will be passed on through the stack all right then the call whenever you make a call a return address is to be stored all right and that return address is to be stored now where exactly the program will be returning after after passing all the data to the next instruction the program counter should, like how the execution is 101 will be executed followed by 200 which happens to be the subroutine 200 201 202 200 up to 300 this subroutine will be in, uh, executed when it says return all the data values will be passed passed to this particular statement and program control will come to the next statement after the subroutine 
Okay, so that is the return. So return is to the next, that is 102nd location. You can see the 102nd location has been put onto the stack as the return value and stack pointer, which is not visible unfortunately, SP is pointing to that particular location. All right, so this is how a subroutine call is going to be executed. Okay, so this is subroutine executes, function executes completely, <coughs> then the control returns, all right, then 102nd is executed, 103rd instruction is executed, and at 103, once again there is a call, so then the flow of control goes like this, executes and then 104th instruction will be executed once the subroutine is executed next. How we are storing the, uh, the return address onto the stack, onto top of the stack. As soon as the return statement is encountered, this next instruction to be executed is restored into the PC, all right? And all the data is passed to, uh, that is this particular instruction, all the data is returned to this particular instruction and control, PC gets this particular value. So next instruction to be executed is going to be uh, this, that is 104 in this particular case and uh, in uh, 102 in the other case. So that is how exactly our whole sequence of instruction execution, okay, program control takes place whenever there is a subroutine call. And this concept is very, very important for you to understand the concept of call by value in C, okay. Call by value, etc. okay, the stack is being utilized. So all parameters will be stored above it onto the stack, onto the stack all the parameters will be stored and the return address and those parameters, when you play up with those parameters, the original values doesn't get affected and that is where the, it is call by value. So you learn about call by value in uh, C programming, in C++ programming, it's all based on this particular concept which you are learning in uh, computer organization course, right? And you should be clear about this particular concept because this is very, very important. One important uh, thing which has been hidden over there is SP gets SP minus one because the stack grows in reverse order, all right? So stack is growing from 505 to 504, 503, 502. So it will grow up and it will come down. So when you are pushing something, when you are putting something into the stack, you will be decrementing the stack pointer. And when we are taking out something, you take it out and then decrement the stack pointer. That is how stack works. You will be learning about stack in more details when you go to, uh, when PGDCS students go to PGDCS second semester, MCS student goes to the second semester, and BCS students when you learn the data structure course, all right? So remember this concept, it will be useful at that point of time. All right, the second thing which I would like to take up with you is the addressing schemes. We, we have done addressing schemes for 8086 processor. Here we are consolidating all those uh, addressing schemes with the help of uh, an example or a, a, a diagram in that sense. So this is my program, all right? It is in the main memory, okay? So the first addressing mode, so this is addressing mode, this is the instruction, that is operation code, and this is the operand. All right, so this is the operand. So when I say within, now this is my instruction. So this instruction I'll be executing, I'll be taking it to instruction register. But we are showing just the instruction for the sake of where exactly the data will be residing, okay? So when this instruction, okay, I, when that is immediate instruction mode is used, this actually seven becomes the operand value. Immediate means operand is residing within the instruction. So when this load statement is to be executed, okay, obviously this instruction will be fetched into instruction register. It will be decoded, and when it when it comes uh, when we know that this is the uh, the operand uh, uh, that is addressing mode happens to be immediate. That means whatever value 0, 07 or whatever value is in the uh, in the operand mode uh, operands of the machine that will be directly transferred to the wherever the first operand in this particular case it should be ac so this value will be transferred to ac so you have initialized that particular value of ac by 0, 07 so this this particular instruction so if it is immediate operand is there it's very easy to execute the instruction so why not all immediate operands? 
Well, immediate operands are very useful when you are initializing a value, but you change values all the time, all right? And when you change values, you have to bring those values from some location. So initialization, some constants, okay? In those cases, you use immediate operands. Very useful for that because they are directly available in the instruction itself. So you don't need to fetch the operand at all, right? Instruction fetch itself is going to bring the operand. The second addressing mode, which is the most important for us, because most of the time instructions is, are going to be, uh, that is the operand is going to be reside in the uh, memory location. Okay, so this is that case, load D, D happens to be direct addressing mode and uh, uh, operand address is 500. So location 500 contains my operand. So this, when this instruction is fetched into the instruction register, at the operation that is addressing mode will be direct. So this value, that means that in the next step, this 500, that is location content of 500 is, is going to be brought into the CPU. Only then processing can take place as far as this instruction is concerned. However, uh, this is one of the necessity because most of the time born in von Neumann architecture, we are getting the data from the memory. Cache is going to definitely help in enhancing the speed of this particular operation. But cache is not going to do anything else than other than that, right? So cache will definitely enhance the speed, overall speed of execution of this particular instruction. Why? Because if I'm bringing data from 500 location, then it is taking, uh, the memory is, uh, as we said, around 50 times slower. So it may take slightly more time. But if we use cache and the data is available in cache, the speed of the cache and processor are almost identical, although cache is a bit slower. So we will be running almost at the speed of the processor. So this is why it is going to enhance the speed of overall execution. So cache is just going to enhance the speed, but addressing mode is this way it, you interpret the addressing mode. Now this is a very, uh, third is a very interesting, it is indirect, that is what is being represented, indirect 500. So the location 500 stores the address of the operand, okay? So indirect means that this location stores address of the operand. That means first I'll be bringing the address of the operand into the main memory and then I'll be able to bring the operand. So this indirect mode of uh, addressing, memory addressing is somewhat very, very expensive and nowadays it is not being utilized in the latest of processor. This is there for the historical purposes. However, we instead of uh, indirect location, that is memory location, registers can be used, indirect mode of registers, right? So that is what you can uh, see is somewhat visible over here, where instruction is having a register, which basically shows the address of the operand, okay? So then the, the register, that is, this is also indirect. So the, that is register has the address of operand, which is then fetched and the instruction, uh, the advantage of this kind of in situation, you remember that we used BX and SI, right? That kind of addressing modes in assembly, okay? So this uh, is very, very important. Why this is very important? Because the register actually slow, uh, fast, hasten up this indirect mode in a uh, much better way because register is already with the with the instruction, okay? It is already in the CPU, so it will hasten up the operation of fetching the operand. All right, and this is the final one where some displacement is also added in the register value. Once again, that displacement is passed of part of the instruction. So this kind of an addressing mode is mostly utilized when you are dealing with arrays, okay? Sometimes you use auto indexing, then you don't require this offset, but this offset is that this is the first location of array, and this A represents the uh, that, that is your index, that is the variant, loop invariant, first location, I can be one, two, that's how you ad address an index, uh, array, right? Array is, uh, array is being stored, okay, somewhere, which will be pointed to by register R, the base location, and within the array, which offset, which uh, element you are trying to refer to, fifth, sixth, that will be in the offset, and both are added to form the actual address within the memory. So addressing modes are very, very important and these are the four or five addressing modes which are very, very common and mean most of the time, uh, barring uh, the indirect one, these four are picked up for uh, for machine instructions and this, these are the, this is the case for 8086 mi microprocessor also. You will find that they are existing over there. All right.
So this is what we uh, have talked about uh, as far as what we have talked about the instruction set. But instruction set cannot execute without the registers and the ALU structure, right? So I just want to bring the once again the context of ALU structure. The units of ALU like uh, bus interface unit and execution units of H086. All right. In fact, that is the whole microprocessor in, in a particular set. Let's not simply uh, uh, put it to ALU. Okay, so we had two units of the microprocessor, bus interface unit and execution unit. So take it as a basically ALU structure we'll do, do a little bit later, but a microprocessor technically consists of some structure, right? Some uh, uh, units which can execute in parallel like bus interface unit and execution unit of 8086. And then the registers which are responsible, if you remember 8086 microprocessor, there were, uh, there were segment registers, there were AX, BX, CX, DX, general purpose registers, right? There were special purpose registers like segment registers, there were pointer registers, there were stack uh, segment, uh, stack pointer register, there was instruction pointer register which is pointing to the instruction, okay? Okay, so all that uh, uh, registers were there. And there, the, there were finally there were flags registers which are also a sort of uh, sometimes special purpose register. Each flag register is one. Each flag register consists of several bits. So each flag is only one bit. All right, that is the common convention in most of the processors. And through this, the, what we are basically knowing the basic structure. Okay, basic structure of the CPU which is there. Now we know what what instruction set should be required what addressing modes are required, right? What are the kinds of how the operands, that means how the addressing mode basically tell us how the operands are going to be addressed, all right? So this is how we basically know about various things as far as microprocessors are concerned and the processor is concerned. But how exactly these operations will be performed, all right? Now that is one of the most important situation for us. Think in terms of uh, any instruction you take, okay? Uh, right, uh, suppose we assume an instruction, uh, let's say this instruction, execution of increment A and skip the next instruction of, uh, uh, of the result if the result is zero. Okay, now this instruction we are wanting to execute. All right, uh, that is add and skip. All right, add one into, the, in, uh, into a particular register. If it uh, comes out to be uh, zero, the result comes out to be zero, then skip the, that means the uh, value stored may be negative value in that particular, uh, the, uh, uh, I mean register where the value is to be added. Now think in this particular instruction in a very simple manner. This instruction will be residing where? In the memory. It cannot reside anywhere else, all right? Now the first operation, so if I want to execute an instruction, I'll be requiring step-by-step -step execution of the operations which will execute an instruction. Now this is very important for you to learn, all right? The first thing you need to do, please remember this, you got to bring the instruction from the main memory to the processor register, okay, which we normally call instruction register, all right. So when we want to bring instruction to instruction register, only then it can be decoded and executed, all right. So this is the first, I mean just don't concentrate on this part, just concentrate on this particular area. So the first thing is I need to bring the instruction into the into uh, memory all right so how do i do that where exactly is the address of the next instruction resides the program counter register all right so this program counter register contains the address of next instruction to be executed now i transfer the program counter to memory address register which is interface to what? Which is interface to memory bus, all right? The processor to memory bus. So it is interface to processor to memory bus. Technically, 
memory address register is AR stands for address. That means this, this register applies its content onto the bus for the memory. All right, and they can be, uh, I mean, latches also, which will store from the bus, the data can be stored by the memory unit. That, that is a secondary kind of a statement, right? So we are not going to uh, go into that domain. We are simply saying that the first statement is, PC is transferred to address register. Then the control unit will be asked that the next sequence I want Whatever location is addressed by MAR register, that means put address register will be putting this information onto the bus. Okay, the address unit of memory will be latching on, I mean, taking that particular information from the address bus. Okay, at that point of time, will get loaded with the address, the content of address bus. All right, who will control that? the control unit okay by issuing appropriate control signals for that however what micro operation is going to be performed at that point of time the data register right so whatever is pointed to by mar memory address register okay so that content will be put onto the data bus and data bus content will be cached by the DR register. So this is the second micro operation. Okay, what does it integrate? That whatever location has been pointed to by memory address register, that location, that means PC, right? PC was the address of address of the memory location, right? Where the next instruction is residing. That instruction now, right, comes to DR register. All right. So DR gets that particular information. Since I have already done up with this PC, in parallel, I don't need this PC anymore. It is to be incremented to the next instruction. So assuming that the next instruction is residing in the next memory location, so I simply increment PC. This is a very simple machine, okay? Not complicated, so that you can understand how machine actually works, all right? So PC gets incremented to the next instruction because this instruction have, have not now been fetched to DR register, it will be fetched to DR register, address has already been put, so I don't need to worry about it. So increment the PC parallelly, right? So these two operation can be performed in parallel, all right? So only one, during the same time these two operations will be performed, okay? And then finally instruction register gets the data register. So this value is transferred to instruction register, which basically is related with the control unit. So for interpreting it, we will simply transfer it into instruction register where the operations can be performed. All right. So this is how the whole sequence of instruction fetch works. This is for a typical machine. It's not that it will be required for all the machine. This is not going to happen for all the machines. Every, every machine will have different set of micro operations. But this simply, with this simple set of micro operation, what we are trying to tell you that even a machine instruction will require several steps at different point of time. All right. And this is actually comes under the category of uh, complex instruction set computers, right? So in any case, all the machines will have a sequence of steps. So this is how the machine instruction is fetched. All right. So now that instruction is in instruction register. What is the next step of uh, execution? The next step will be, let's decode in this particular instruction and which will be done by the control unit. How the decoding is going to take place? The, the operation code, right? Operation code will be checked and operation code is actually used to branch to a control memory location where the microprogram of that particular uh, instruction resides. So every instruction has its own microprogram and that microprogram consists of sequence of micro instructions. Each micro instruction deals with one 
time one one micro I mean one time of micro operation. So these two will be dealt with together. This will be dealt with one micro instruction. This will be second. This will be third like that. But these are for fetching the instruction right. Here what we are referring to decoding the instruction right. So decoding that is a, basically decoding is simply a jump. Decoding simply causes a jump to the related microprogram and we will see the execution uh, oriented microprogram very shortly. All right. Then the next thing which need to be done is the operand. Okay. When you have decoded, you also decoded the addressing mode. All right. So addressing modes tells us either it is a direct address, right. It can be immediate also, but th that has been ignored in this particular case. So what we are referring to only two addressing modes, direct addressing mode or indirect addressing mode. Suppose it is a direct addressing mode, then in the indirect register, whatever is the address portion of the instruction, all right. Sorry, not indirect register, this is instruction register. So in the instruction register, whatever is the address portion of the instruction, that contains address of the operand, if it is a direct operand, right. So both these registers are containing the same value because DR and IR contains the same value so, so, so far, all right. So basically address portion of instruction register contains the operand. However, it is an indirect address, then the, the one which we shown, right, that is the memory location. So what will happen? That address will be passed on to MAR and the instruction, uh, that is the data. This time we are not fetching the instruction. What, what is, this is the address of the operand, right? So the address of operand is in the MR, MAR register and that MAR register is now being fetched into DR. That means uh, whatever now we are getting in the address, IR address portion will be the address of the operand. All right. So we are reading it once. Okay. Here we have the address in the in the instruction register itself. But here we have to bring it from the memory because it is an indirect address. So the address of the operand is within the memory. So that memory location is going to be fetched with these two instructions. That is address of that memory location will be passed on and then it will be read. And what is being, what have you read? You have read the address of the data which is in the memory, okay. So now indirect address technically has been converted into a direct address. So instruction address now after execution of indirect address will contain the address of the operand, effective address of the operand, where exactly the operand is residing in the memory, that's all. So here we are assuming that operands are in the memory. In direct case, directly that address is available to us. In indirect case, once again we do the fetching to get the address of the operand in IR. So now instruction register contains what? Address of the operand within the memory. Right? If, if it is direct, it already contains. In the indirect, we will be fetching the operand address once. All right? So that is how the instruction indirect address is going to work. All right. Now comes the most important part. Okay? Execution of, in, uh, of increment A and skip the next instruction if, right? Result is zero, not off. Okay. Now, how this particular st situation is proceeding. So now, what does my instruction register address part contains? The address of the operand, right? So that address we are passing on and getting the data into the data register, right? So you apply that, you give that address to MAR and issue the memory read operand operation. Control unit will do that, but micro operation is this is the reading micro operation. That is whatever is in the memory location, that was the operand location. So that is going to be brought into DR register, all right. Increment A, so A has been brought. Where exactly was the A? A, assuming that it was an indirect or direct operand, it does not matter now in, uh, in this particular case because had it been an indirect operand, it has already been converted to a direct operand. If it is direct operand, the no step is needed, all right. So now A is, is brought into the memory as a result of these two micro operations. Once A is in the memory, right, what is it to be done? Increment A. Now, incrementing it, 
in, in the accumulator register, here we are assuming R1 is the accumulator register, all right. So then we are taking the, that is the value of A into R1 register, increment the R1 register and DR gets the R1 register, right. DR gets the data register gets R1 register in addition to this particular thing. MAR gets PC, all right. MAR is given the value of PC and uh, that particular value is stored back into A, right, incremented value. Now this is writing, MAR gets the PC value. Now DR is written back to MAR register. So you have incremented the value of A. Right? So, incrementation of value of A will be completed after we have written that particular value into the memory location, right? And that memory location was already there, okay, right? Uh, this PC, actually this MAR to DR is good enough, this step may not be needed in this particular case. All right, because we are not reading the next instruction. Okay, now uh, comes the most important stuff. If R1 equals 0, so just forget this particular line. So DR gets R1, when DR gets R1, okay, and it is basically what you are doing, you are writing it to the memory location, whichever was belonging to A, right? So you have written the data, you have incremented the location A, all right. Now, if R1 equals to 0, right, what we have to do? Then PC is incremented by 1. What is the increment A and skip the next instruction? So result of incrementation was in R1 and skip the next instruction. Suppose that is the next instruction is whatever is the next instruction where exactly that was. In the fetch we have in the fetch itself we have incremented this particular value and it was pointing to the next instruction. So that instruction need to be skipped, right? So PC was already pointing to the next instruction. So if R1 contains 0, then PC should be incremented by one more so that the, the instruction which was there in PC right now is the next instruction to increment a instruction that will be skipped. That is how the operations are being performed, right? That is how the, uh, I mean the execution, execution, the whole thing is performed. And remember one thing, if R1 equals to 0 is a if then else condition, that means even in control unit, I require if then else, all right? So this is, so that means the microprogram wherever the microprograms are, they also need to check flags and on that basis the required circuitry or required uh, control signals will be activated and that is how the instruction execution as far as uh, related to a, a particular instruction using the micro operations will be performed. So there is a cohesion between, micro, in, in, between the control unit as well as the the uh, the arithmetic uh, unit and, and the memory as far as fetching the information from the memory and all these things. There has to be a lot of cohesion between the bus, between the uh, ALU, between the, uh, the, the register, register uh, all the registers and between the control unit because that is how the whole sequence of operations are going to be performed. Now moving on to the uh, next statement, this is instruction pipeline. Now this is a very important concept although it is not related to what we have been discussing so far. But instruction pipeline is something which primarily does lot of work, I mean it is something like uh, f enhancing the speed of the processor. If suppose all the sequences, all these sequences are to be performed in sequence. Right? So first the instruction fetch will be done, then the indirect address will be done, then the execution of uh, the instruction will be performed and the storing of results will be performed. So if all these things are being performed, right, they can be performed in a sequence, can they be performed in an overlapped fashion? Now that's a difficult question, right? And this is the basis of instruction pipeline. So if an instruction execution can be divided into several number of steps. First one is instruction fetch, 
you see you saw the three uh, or four micro operations which can be performed in three time uh, three uh, steps only right then instruction decode so this is going to be performed within the processor then operand fetch then execution technical execution and storing the result so there can be three or four or five depending on the uh, design of the machine the actually the reason why we i am saying two three four or five because all these steps one two three four and five should be comparable then only instruction pipeline makes a sense in that particular sense why they should be comparable because all the segments suppose some an instruction is performing instruction fetch the second instruction should also perform like this block size should be same the time taken for each of the operand should be the same then only the pipeline will proceed in the rightful manner right and second they should not be dependent on each other so that means if instruction fetch is there it should not interfere with uh, operand operand uh, something uh, that is operand fetch right because some uh, some instruction will be doing operand fetch along with it so they should not be interfere with each other so there should be different circuitry for the, that on all, okay so all these steps so more complex is your processor if you are doing the instruction pipeline if your processor is complex it does not make uh, i mean the point is that we want to make the instruction execution faster by doing the overlapping of instruction execution there are more problems as far as instruction i mean uh, as far as instruction pipelines are concerned in addition to the hardware which we have discussed so far but look into the instruction pipeline so far so if i just have these seven instruction and one two there are five uh, steps five time slots so in each uh, suppose i'm executing all these instructions in a sequential manner then there will be 35 time slots which will be required to execute all these seven instructions but how many time slots is are being required using this instruction pipeline only 11 pipeline 11 slots and how we are proceeding instruction fetch instruction decode like that when the instruction decode of the first instruction is going on at that point of time second instruction will be fetched it's like that when this, this two operations are going on the third instruction will be fetched okay fourth instruction will be fetched here fifth will be fetched here sixth will be here and seventh will be here and the pipeline will be now full so pipeline is full and the whole thing will go on very very well however there are problems whenever you do a brilliant concept there are problem with that particular brilliant concept and in this particular brilliant con concept is the if else condition suppose this is an if condition and branch is to be taken to let's say instruction 7 that means execution of 4 5 6 is not required at all right and we will not come to know about the branch is to be taken or not till the execution is there right till the execution ex is going to be there that means we have to undo 4 5 6 we have to empty the pipeline and then start with instruction 7 so there is a branch penalty all right so branch penalty is always going to be when we are doing instruction pipeline there are techniques of overcoming these branch penalties right it's not that uh, everything has been left to the lurch but they you, those things if you want to know you need to go to the further reading and learn about it all right second pro kind of problem is suppose this instruction is uh, evaluating an operand c which is required in this particular second instruction all right c is being used here and c is required in this particular equation uh, right a second instruction so there is a dependency of data so that will not be available till the execution takes place so once again this particular instruction has to be delayed so there are many problems in the instruction pipeline i mean nothing is there are no free bullets and there are no no uh, free things as far as uh, uh, the life goes and everywhere the things are right similarly in the instruction pipeline there is nothing free all right so uh, this is how the whole uh, instruction pipeline works but overall instruction pipeline does increase the efficiency of execution and there are a lot of steps are taken to uh, to uh, make it more efficient uh, as far as instruction pipeline is concerned now with this we uh, we have dealt with a fair a fair number of uh, uh, basics about the information and that is instruction set the micro operation let's now focus on 
ALU organization. And this is going to be, once again, if you have understood the first two concepts, then only you will be able to make this particular thing off very, very easily. Now, this is a typical arithmetic operation or unit. And if you remember the full adder circuit which we had designed, and there were uh, uh, four bit, four, four uh, I think, four bit adder we have uh, created, right? Ripple four bit adder. It's something looks like the same circuit, except we have added a multiplexer here, all right? And in the multiplexer, there are two select lines, which basically determines which of the, like C in is directly going to the, the, the to the adder. So full adder adds three bits, right? One. One uh, of the operand is being fetched directly, but we are controlling the second operand, all right? And it is only a partial table which has been shown over here. You can refer to the full table as far as your block is concerned. Now, how exactly this thing is going to work? So A is directly going to the full adder. What we are controlling is the B input, all right? So what input will be going to the from the multiplexer, I mean the Y input rather than saying B input, what is going to be Y, all right? X is going to be directly as A, right? So the first operand is coming directly, C is in coming directly, okay? What is being controlled is B. And this is an arithmetic operation being performed. This is actually an arithmetic logic unit, one single bit of that, okay? Now, if B is coming directly as zero, so select, select signals will be controlling whether zero will be selected, one will be selected, two or three. So you will be basically, S1 and S0 will be determining what is going to be selected, all right? So S1, S0 is going to, so zero. With zero, if what we see, what is, uh, what is connected? B0, right? So bit zero. So similarly, all, all uh, units which will be there in parallel, right? So B1, B2, bit one. So the input will is going to be the first bit of uh, input B. It is, it, is, it is fetching the first bit of uh, input A, all right? So A is always there with X0, X and B0, right? So B0, the bit one is directly coming here. So if I have S1 as 0, S, S0 as 0, so there are two entries over here because C in can be 0 or 1, so we'll consider it as only one entry, all right? So what is going to be Y value? Because there are multiple, so it is going to be B0 is directly coming to it, right? So it is going to be equal to B, right? B0, B1, B2, B3 for different adder units, right? So there can be more, more units, one, two, three, four, like that, and all will have the similar circuit. So the uh, for, for the adder units, what will be going in? Complete B. B consists of B0, B1, B2, B3 bits, right? So B0 is coming here, B1 will be going to the next one, B1, uh, B2 will be going to the next, and so on and so forth. All right. So if select input is zero, we get B as input. However, if select bit is one, Right, so this is zero, 01, these two cases. What we are seeing, we are not considering in this particular diagram right now. So what is going to be entering? B increment, why? Because we are complementing B here, and that is going to one. So B complement will be going here, all right? So simply B complement will be going into the input. No problem, so far so good, all right? Okay, now next, uh, what happens? Okay, now what hap happens next is the third, over here logic zero. So we are connecting it to logic zero. So if second input is connected, okay, so what is the, once again ignore the scene, what we are getting? One zero, right? One zero is two, all right? So in this particular case, what we are getting? Zero being fed. And in case uh, logic zero is inverted, right? So three is coming to that, that means for last case, all ones will be coming to the all ones, means three all ones will be coming, all zeros will be coming, all one byte bits will be coming to all the full adder units. Okay, so this is how it is going to work in this particular case. Now how it relates to the micro operation. Now let's look into the micro operation of each one. Okay, so if I'm putting S01, S, uh, so this is one, zero, zero, and C in is zero. So what is the input of X? Obviously A, right? What is the input of Y? B, 
for all the, I mean, for every full adder, it, it, this will have B0, this will have B1, and there is a, this is a full adder. So, what is, get, what is the result of this particular full adder? A plus B. So, A is coming here, B is here. So, A plus B is going to be the output, right? The, the, I mean, carry bits, etc. will, can be adjusted. They are being passed on to the next one. But technically speaking, so when CN is 0, what is going to be the operation? What is going to be the micro operation which is being simulated by this particular unit? Simply A plus B. That means register A, if I am putting it, register R1, right? R1 is inputting A0 and R2 is inputting B0, then it is simply addition of register R1 with register R2. And wherever suppose it is going to register another register the output, then we can simply say R2 gets R1 plus R2. So this is that particular simulation. Look into this. So what we are getting? Still we are inputting B, but there is a carry in. All right. So what are we going to get? A plus B plus 1, right? A plus B plus 1, which is coming from C in, right? So the operation is R1 plus R2 plus 1, all right? What is this one? This is a very interesting one, okay? 0, 1, 0. So what we are getting, this, that means B, B complement we are getting. So overall effect is A plus B complement, because input bit is 0. A plus B complement is subtraction. A minus B plus 1. So there is already a carry, right? So this is this is called subtraction with borrow. Because we do subtraction with 2's complement, right? So 1 is missing over there. So this is subtraction with borrow. What about this one? Over here, the, the 1 bit is already there. So this is simply A minus B. So this is a subtraction of micro operation which is being done, all right? In this particular case, Simply transfer, okay? A, I mean, A, the output is going to be A, right? In both the cases and this one is going to increment A by 1, right? So this is simply transfer A, this is increment A, all right? And this is, when we are inputting 0, this is actually decrementing the value, all right? This is going to be decrement, so you can test it. Suppose your value is 0, 1, 1, right? Just 3 bits. And I add 1, 1, 1 to it, right? So what we, what I'm going to get? There will be carry out 1, which is ignored. So we get 0, 1, 0 as output. So the carry out will be ignored. So you can try that particular thing out. This will actually decrement your value, register R1, all right? Or the value of A will be decremented by 1. And this is basically, uh, basically what is there? It is the two's complement stuff, right? Because your, uh, the, your, your in, uh, the input is all ones, plus one, all right? It's, no, 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 two's complement, I mean, that is simply, the one will be ignored. So nothing, just transfer. So like that, like that, all these micro operations can be simulated from this particular data. And they have been completely given, I mean, these are just uh, seven or eight, which I have shown to you, but, um, and these are eight only and they are in the, your block also contain on eight only. They are the description of all these operation is also given. So study them as per the description which we have today, right? You will be finding it easier to go through them and you will understand them. Do it, I mean, today itself, don't delay it, okay? Now, the, uh, the second thing which we have in the micro, uh, micro operation sequences is 8 out of 16 uh, possible logical micro, uh, micro operation with 2 bit. Now, this table is also from your block only. Now, x0, suppose we have 2 bits, x and y, right? So, these, these are the possible values, x0, y0, x0, y1, 1, 0, 1, 1. Now, what are the possible outputs? Suppose x0, 0, 0 what is the output 0, 0, 0, 0. So what we are getting, technically we are clearing that particular register. By doing this particular micro operation, if, if the output is all zeros, right, with these two bits, so I'm simply clearing the information. Now if the output is, output of 0, 0 is 0, 0, 1 is 0, 1, 0 is 0, and 1, 1 is 1, what is that operation? And, so technically it is and operation of x and y. Right? So just by using two bits uh, over here, we can simulate 
eight, in fact, 16 logic micro operations. And out of that, we can select as many. Your, your uh, block shows that we have selected only four, which includes and, or, not, and zor. All right. Over here, what we see, x0 is 0, this is 0. Now, this is, what is there? 1, 1. When x is 1, that is the output. So, f3 equals to x. The fourth, like, fourth output is, okay, when the, when the truth table shows 0, 1. For this value, 0, 0, it shows 0. For 0, 1, it shows 1. For 1, 0, it shows 0. And uh, 1, 1, it shows 0. It is x prime y. That is why I have written x prime over there. So, you can see, x prime, all right? So, where, where exactly? That is x prime y. Where exactly you find 1? Where x prime is 1 and y is 1, right? So, this is why it is, uh, sorry, x, uh, x, this is for the different one. I showed it, uh, showed you different one. This is for this case. So, for this case, you have x, y prime. So, y prime is 1 here. X is 1 here, so that is why you get 1 here. For rest all cases, you will get a 0. So like that, you can interpret the truth table. So this is just representing the truth table for two binary, variab uh, two binary variables, X and Y. And that is how, I mean, it can simulate 16 mi logic micro operations <laughs> based on the truth table. All these micro operations are different from each other. Zod is an important one over here. You know about it, X0, Y0. Output is 0, right? X0, Y1, Y uh, output is 1. X1 equals to 1, Y equals to 0. This is what it is. And X1, one, Y1, for ZOR, it should be 0. So that is an XOR operation. So that's how the, uh, the uh, I mean, the, the micro operations can be simulated, but only few can be selected. And accordingly, circuit will be made for the logic micro operation. As far as shift operation is concerned, it is as simple as shift register. So you got to use the shift register which can shift either into the towards the left or to the right and additional circuitry will be required if you want the uh, uh, shifting controls, right? So if you want shifting control, then additional circuitry will be required so that you can, you can circulate, you can do whatever uh, kind of stuff which is required as far as uh, the stuff is concerned. So let us now try to, I mean, uh, conclude this particular whole uh, bit of uh, discussion. What, what I have tried to tell you today is that one of the most important thing as far as CPU organization or when we de de define CPU, the very first thing you should know is the instruction set. And one of the finest example of instruction set is 8086 microprocessor. So you can refer to 8086 microprocessor and what way the registers are, what way the different units are, right? So you can come to know about the CPU organization in that particular sense and that is why we discussed it first, right? So instruction set is very, very important and instruction set primarily include what? The operation code and addressing modes and operands. Right? So, operation code, addressing modes are basically used to interpret how the, what operation is to be performed and addressing mode tells us where exactly the operand is and how it, where, uh, I mean, how it is addressed, whether it is an address of operand or it is address of address of operand that is indirect, that is how it is. But once we know about the instruction set of a computer, the next good thing to know about is how those instructions will be executed. Right? And instructions are executed in a step-by-step -step manner. So those step-by-step, -step, those are operations, are called micro-operations. Right? So instruction fetch will have three steps of, uh, three or four steps. Instruction decode, probably it is just control unit interpreting where exactly the, what kind of micro, uh, uh, what kind of uh, micro instructions. This micro instructions is in unit four. So what kind of micro instructions, where exactly are those micro instructions for the given uh, instructions are going to be. Okay, then moving from, uh, uh, from this, then the execution takes place step by step manner and they all are determined by the micro operations. Now these micro operation, which micro operation is to be enabled? It is to the role of control unit, right? So control unit precisely knows. For example, if we are doing the fetch micro, fetch, 
right? Instruction fetch. And suppose PC is to be incremented. Obviously, a set of control signal only is going to do this particular operation, which is going to issue the micro operation of incrementation, which we have shown you in the ALU, right? So, in the ALU, what uh, I mean, how the S1, S0 and C in, right? So, those S1, S0, S, C in will be controlled by the control unit and this particular, which circuitry is to be enabled? That is also to be controlled by the control unit and those are the control signals. That is the job of control signals and that is why you require control memory uh, in the, in a, uh, I mean, in a microprocessor because if you are do implementing controls through hardware, fine. But if you are implementing through microprogram, then you require programming approach to control unit and microprogrammed control unit in that particular sense, right? But the logic, st uh, logic starts when you are dealing with the micro operations and from micro operations, then you move on to the ALU, how those micro operations has been made possible, right? Within the ALU, how those things are done. In addition to that, you have transfer. Right? So, transfer operation also require control signal, right? Uh, for example, uh, if, uh, uh, if uh, I mean address is to be applied, right? So, control unit only tell the memory unit like this address is for us. So, uh, therefore, if you want to learn about control unit, you should be learning about the first, uh, that the micro operations and the arithmetic logic unit, how exactly it implements those micro operations. So, this insight is essential. In fact, it will uh, give you, I mean, uh, I, I feel a lot of pleasure in uh, learning about it. I am really hopeful that you will also uh, enjoy learning about them because it is very interesting concept that how whole thing can be simulated in a computer system and we know something which uh, we should be knowing because we are uh, utilizing computer for our day to day working without even knowing what exactly it is doing, right? So maybe tomorrow if you decide to be an Intel programmer, you should be knowing all these kinds of things. So with this, I think uh, the essence or the crux of the CPU and all related stuff is now, uh, I think I have tried to communicate to you. Uh, however, you are please I mean, you are free to ask as many questions on it. This is not, once again, uh, the whole computer organization course is uh, not very, very obvious, uh, I mean, simple course. It requires logical understanding. And who else have better done, uh, logic than you, right? So you are the best person to learn about it in a great uh, details. Uh, let me assure you, this is going to help you tremendously if you, uh, when you become the operating system designers, when you become the machine designers, when you become the compiler designers, and that's what you should be uh, five years from now, maybe, right? Because uh, we don't want you to be sitting just doing application program all the time. You are doing professional course, and when you are doing professional course, your knowledge should keep on increasing day by day and you should, I mean, you should be learning even after you complete your MCA, you should be learning in that particular spirit and going ahead into your career all the time. So uh, with this, I would like to end the session for the day. Uh, I wish you a lot of luck. Um, if uh, time permits, I'll take another session next week, uh, completely giving you a complete roundup from the very beginning till the end of uh, this particular course. However, you're most welcome to ask questions, as many questions as you like. Thank you for being with me. Bye for now.